Excellent. All right, love the little dancing gif the slash emoji there. Um, we'll we'll, we'll kind of uh, I'll kind of do a quick kickoff and then you know just a couple of quick slides and then we'll go ahead and um, you know pass the uh, stage to Gigi there. But uh, thank you, Gigi, for joining us. For those of you who don't know, Gigi Knight is our uh, host today, and I'm moderating. My name is Damon Aurora, um, and I am from the Crowdfunder team. And of course, as you can see from the slide, the topic today is growing your fans across uh, your social platforms. And Gigi has done that the looks of it quite successfully. So hopefully we'll learn <laughs> a thing or two from Gigi. Um, OK, Gigi, can you uh, move to the next slide, please? Yes, I can. Thank you. All right, so for any of you who um, are new to Crowdfunder, don't know quite what it is, Crowdfunder is a creator-friendly crowdfunding platform. It is free, um, and yep, that's pretty much it. It's free, we do have obviously different tiers, but we do have one where you can just go ahead, start your campaign today for free. We don't charge you anything for it if that's the, um, if that's the tier that works best for you. There's tons of powerful functionalities and they all do come with that free plan as well. So it's not like you're gonna lose out on anything. We do really prioritize in putting our people and planet first. So we try to be a carbon neutral company. We do want to work directly with artists and understanding what their needs are and, and make sure the product is catering to their need, the platform is catering to their needs. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can get started right away if you go to crowdfunder.com. And again, that's F-U-N-D-R. The link is on the bottom right there. Uh, you can go ahead, start a campaign for free. You know, no gatekeeping. It's up there for you to go ahead and get going. And more importantly, I should mention that you can really run any size campaign. You don't have to have like a $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 project. If you've got the vision for a sticker you want to make and it's going to take $500, run that project. You know, we think creators are doing important work and all, all art is worth sharing. So even if you have a smaller project, it's like, let's, let's share it with that world, right? So feel free to go ahead and start the project. Don't feel like you have to have this massive thing planned out. Uh, you always can if you have one, but um, we like seeing the projects small and big. Uh, next slide, please, Gigi. Thank you. Uh, I should also quickly mention, we do have what we call the Creator Hub in Crowdfinder, and it is a space that we've um, built for creators of all kind. And it's not really meant for a place for us to like really just advertise you know, our platform, but it's really more of a, a hub as the name implies for creators to go in and, and collaborate with each other, learn from each other, ask questions of each other. So if you have, you know, if you're a comic book creator and you have questions around publishers or uh, you know, artists you wanna know about that people have worked with, or for that matter, even just kind of hear how people have um, you know, dealt with certain things in their field, this is the place to go ahead and do it. We do exclusive webinars, uh, you know, we, like the one we're doing today, we promote it on there. Uh, the networking events we'll try to do, we've got different forums and toolkits for the platform that we share on there. Our team is on there as well. So if you have questions about the product or features or just guidance on running a campaign, uh, that's also a place where we are actively participating. So feel free to check that out. Uh, we're growing that community. And obviously we would love to see all of you there uh, at some point soon. And I think we have one more GG for me. Yeah. And just one final thing to mention, uh, there are a couple sessions coming up just to put on your radar. Uh, the first one is tomorrow hosted by myself and my lovely dog Gus, who is more there to just judge me and make sure I don't mess up. Um, <laughs> but he and I will be presenting uh, the platform a bit. We're gonna talk about how uh, Proudfunder, the platform uh, is gonna transform the way uh, you know that your funds uh, that you that you actually raise funds and you have your creative projects. So we'll talk about our platform, how you know what we're doing differently, what we're doing great, and and really focus in on some of those features we think will be super important to your community as you look at you know how you want to raise your funds. And then on the twenty fourth of August, we are going to be doing another session with Robin uh, Warren, and this is more about. Uh, a very important topic, in my opinion, I think a lot of us will agree to this now, uh, where, you know, how do we avoid burnout and stay creative and just self-care in general? I think uh, we all really get into the zone sometimes and we get deadlines and we have to self-set goals that we have. And 
and we really just want to hit it. And then we, we compromise a lot of, you know, our well-being in order to meet those targets. And sometimes that can get to the worst of us. And, and, and it's not the healthiest, but, uh, you know, there are resources out there and Robin is great. She's one that we are super excited to have share with us her, um, her, her knowledge, her experiences, her thoughts, and really help us kind of better understand how we can also avoid those things and just be the best versions of ourselves. So uh, please go ahead and sign up for both of them. You can go to um, crowdfunder.com uh, in, in the creator hub there. I'll actually in the chat box also share the link to the actual page and then we can go ahead and click on that link. If you would like to register for the webinars, you can go ahead and do that directly. So um, with that being said, Gigi, thank you so much for being patient with me and uh, you know, take it away. Yeah, well, thank you so much for all that info. I didn't even know you guys were doing a burnout seminar. I might join that. Um, good morning. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Damon said, I'm Gigi Knight. I'm a Mexican-American body positive artist. I'm based out of the West Coast. And I'm most known for my body positive pinup art and my soft macabre vibes. Um, I want to start this session with a quote from Frida Kahlo. Um, and she once said, escoge una persona que te mire como si quizás fueras magia. And the little translation of that would be, choose a person who looks at you as if you were magic. And the reason I wanted to start with such a quote from a prolific Mexican woman artist is because it sums up my own work pretty well. Um, in that I'm choosing as a body positive pinup artist to make art that makes people look at bodies like mine with joy and love in their hearts. So it, I make work that reminds me and many like me that I deserve to be looked at as if I was magic. Um, and that in turn, you know, kind of gives way to the following I have now. Um, that's me <laughs> many years late, like ago. Um, but a bit on my background, I was born and raised in Las Vegas. And no, I didn't grow up in a casino. <laughs> that was a very common question I got asked by, you know, out of towners and transplants who would move into town and come to school. Um, but all in all, I've always been an artist. From as long as I can remember, I carried a pad of paper, something to write with, something to draw with. And without knowing, I kind of made art my life's mission. Um, I went to a magnet school locally for the graphic design program. And it was there I realized there were people out there that made art their whole way of life and the way that they were making their money. So I set off to go to art school in San Francisco on recommendation of one of my graphic design teachers. And it was in San Francisco, I landed an apprenticeship with Babs Tar, which some of you know for her very important work with DC Comics doing Batgirl of Burnside and uh, her image owned co uh, comic called Motor Crush. And um, Babs really like helped shaped my career in that she was teaching me the business side of being an artist and illustrator. And that's something that a lot of art schools just kind of fail to do. They give you the tools to succeed, but not quite the know-how on how to utilize all the tools you're being given. Um, so I did my best to put myself out there despite being a shy person. And um, I made it a point to go to a drink and draw event to introduce myself to her and tell her how much I appreciate her work. I met her again at the Alternative Press Expo when I went to do self-enrichment and ask other artists doing what I wanted to do, questions about how they got started and, you know, exchange contact information and stuff like that. And from there, because I was such a familiar face, I landed an apprenticeship with her, which now flourished to a business relationship that we share. So I have my own brand, we have a shared brand and uh, honestly making friends in the art world opens so many doors for you. Um, but it really wasn't until after art school that I started to find my voice as an artist. So I wanted to present my first and biggest tip for any creator, and that's making what you love. And it's, it's very common sense, but you'd be surprised how many people in your life are going to tell you 
you can't draw X, Y, Z for the rest of your life and expect to be hired. So many times I was told that like, you know, I need to draw babies. I need to draw men. I need to draw um, older people, younger people, children. But my heart only ever felt passionate about drawing women. And that was in high fashion illustrations, pinup art. Um, Art Nouveau had the biggest grip on my heart. And anytime I saw an Alphonse Mucha piece, I swooned. Um, but I set out on instinct to be a professional in what I was passionate about without being aware that so many people before me had done that. And I'll up, and at the same time being aware of that because that's what Alphonse Mucha did. That's what you know Gibson did with his ink illustrations. That's what Vargas did with his pinup girls. They made it their life's work. Um, and, you know, that being obvious, how does that relate to self-promotion? Um, when you end up inevitably making work that you feel lukewarm about, you're going to be quiet about that work. You're not proud of it. So you do it for a paycheck and then you kind of just squirrel it away. It sits at the end of your portfolio because you're not, you don't feel any way about it except for that made me money. Great. So when you start making work you're passionate about, you're loud about it. And that's half the struggle when it comes to promoting yourself, being loud and being very much involved in what you're making to the point where you're putting it in everyone's face. Like, look at this. I love this. So you should love this too. And because of that, you know, at the time back in like 2015, 2016, I was making fan art because that's what I was passionate about. And at the same time, I was putting down roots in the comics industry by making friends in the industry. And I landed in front of um, Alice Castle's radar, who ran this weekly article on Multiversity Comics called, you know, Art of the Week. And she was featuring some of my fan art alongside some really amazing comic art, which was very much wild. But obviously, as time grew on, so did my style. And I was walking away from making fan art. And as I moved more towards original concepts, I was surprised that Alice and later Michael Mazzacane continued to share my work in their weekly roundup, even though it had nothing to do with the comics world. I was just making cool work. And it was very heartwarming and validating. And like, it gave me the confidence in part to continue to pursue just making word that made me feel passionate. And nowadays I very rarely make fan art. But what I do do is I strive to make the next piece a piece I'm as proud of as the last one I made. Um, to speak more on my journey about finding my voice and how that correlates with self-promotion, um, these are my roots as an artist. Like I started very traditionally. And the one thing that you figure out over time is that growth truly does not happen overnight, but it is happening all the time simultaneously. So while you don't feel like you're growing, when you stand still and look back at your body of work, you see the miles and miles that you've come away from where you started and the choices that you now make compared to, to choices that you used to make in your work. So finding your style is truly a journey that is like informed by time, by taste, and a lot by patience. Um, all I can say is the most valuable part of that journey is to never stop drawing and never stop creating. So to, put, to coin a term that a lot of professionals like to use is put in those pencil miles. And those hours you spend practicing your craft truly accumulate and they shift the terrain of your style just a little bit day by day. And honestly, you know, I wish I could say Success happened overnight, but it took me at least three years to truly start building my own following. So I graduated in 2014 from my art college, and I didn't start finding my own voice until maybe June of 2016, which is two years later. And then I didn't start truly building a following until a year after that. So that's three years of just figuring out my own voice of practicing my craft every day and figuring out what I wanted the mission of my work to be essentially. 
And even now in 2022, I would still say my brand is putting down its roots. Like it's still in its infancy. That being said, creating a brand that speaks for you is, uh, is difficult. It, it takes a lot of self-introspection, a lot of asking yourself what your values are, what you want to show in your work so that people, the second they look at it, they kind of have an understanding about you, um, what you're passionate about, and what kind of work they can continue to expect from you consistently throughout the future. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to curate that kind of portfolio, but over time, it, it naturally happens. Because the one thing that I've learned the most is to make my work something that I see myself in, in order to echo that in other people. Life is such a shared experience that when you put something you've experienced personally on paper, I can guarantee you that a handful, if not half of your following will feel similarly because one, they follow you already for your type of work and two, your work with your values instilled into it will attract the same kind of people you would become friends with or want to surround yourself with. And they're the people that are the most excited to share in that with you and share that with other people. So this is my little pink witch that I made in June of 2016. And she was the beginning of my brand's journey and that I made her just to smile and just to feel good about myself. And I was very startled to see that my following at the time resonated with her so much. Like they all held her up in front of her friends and like in front of their friends, I mean, and they were like, oh my God, look, it's me. And they would tag their, their sisters and their family and their best friend and be like, it's me, it's you, it's us. Like I've never seen something so adorable or so heartwarming. And it was the biggest paradigm shift for me in that I couldn't believe that making work that made me personally happy, that was so self-indulgent, had been so successful and so exciting to my following. Um, and she started on just a sketchbook that was the size of my palm. Like I did an entire little sketchbook of just her. And to this day, she's still my logo. That's the logo I still use on all my branding, on all my packaging, and it's part of the first enamel pin I'd ever made. And now to get into the meat of how my brand, you know, shifted into self-promotion and figuring out how not to just make this about art, but also make this a business for myself. Um, tips on how I grew my brand that I see have consistently worked across the board for a lot of friends, um, a lot of colleagues is uh, the first one would be to participate in major hashtags. And it sounds easy, but setting the intention to make that work in order to share it takes a lot of effort and that you're now setting deadlines for yourself and setting an intentional schedule that you have to follow. Um, some of these hashtags are a month long, which is a big commitment. But if you can at least commit half of that time you're making it work that's relevant, that's exciting, hopefully to you if you pick the right hashtags and that you know will get you in front of eyes of new people that would never have seen your work otherwise. So some examples I can give that are actionable now are um, Portfolio Day on Twitter is very big. There's a couple that happen a year. There's, a, I believe, a schedule you can find out there if you Google it. Um, mermaid during the month of May is still very prevalent. If you love mermaids or writing about mermaid related items and things. Sketchuary happens in February. And that is just the intention to sketch every day and share that sketch with other people participating in that tag. And um, if you can't work on a monthly scale, there's daily hashtags that happen that you can just work from week to week. Monday Merms still happens for a lot of people, which Wednesday was one of my favorites to participate in because I love drawing witches. Fan Art Friday is a really big one. And um, I'm sure there's even more out there, but those are the ones that had been most relevant to me at the time when I used them. Um, sorry, I got lost. 
And then next would be, be clear on the work that works for you. So these hashtag challenges are great, but you shouldn't be just doing them to do them. People kind of can feel when you are feeling not very excited about the tag you're participating in. So set the intention to find and research tags that really correlate with the kind of work that you want to be known for and the kind of work you want to be making professionally. And if you don't find any, make one. It pays to often be the trendsetter in something that doesn't exist yet. And you, you essentially start making the pie from scratch instead of being a piece of the pie that already exists. And uh, a lot of us saw that happen with Inktober. This creator, uh, you know, he made a whole monthly hashtag challenge that took off immensely to the point it almost became like a religious participation every year from nearly the entire art community. So who knows? I mean, that could be what happens to you if you start your own hashtag. And in terms of participating, making sure that you're finding ways to make the work you love relevant on occasion. You don't have to force it. You don't have to like make sure that every piece you make has to be relevant. As long as you're passionate about it, you can do that effortlessly. And I have an example in terms of um, May the 4th. I was really big in participating in Mermaid for so many years. I still do on occasion. And I had set the intention of putting my work in front of the Star Wars fandom because I knew it was very big gargantuan, way bigger than the following I had had. So I made my passion with mermaids mix with whatever character resonated with me the most. And that was Queen Amidala. So I made her a mermaid. And that at the time had gotten me more retweets than I had ever seen on my work before. So I definitely was more intentional about mixing big fandom properties with things I was personally passionate about, like I would make Sailor Moon fan art, but I would make them witches or something more personable to me that made me excited. There is really nothing more powerful than mixing your passion with these thoughtful intentions of exposing your, your brand to properties that are far bigger than you and kind of feral on the internet, actually. If you make something cool, make something you're proud of, and you give it to a fandom, they will take it to the ends of the earth. Um, one of the things I've also found that works a lot for me is making definitive statements in my work. And for me, you know, I take that very literally. I will put phrases on pieces that spark conversation often, some good, some bad. Um, I used to do these very cute commissions where I would put like a sassy phrase on them and People were very much endeared by them, so they would buy them because they wanted to display that phrase in their home. That was something that they believed in personally, and it very much excited them to be able to just put it up on a wall and be like, look, this is me. Um, on Facebook, the last time I did that, um, I made a very aggressive statement about diet culture on one of my mermaid pieces, and I think that sparked over 200 comments about people arguing about diet culture in that post. And while the arguments were not great, the it was nice to see that my fans were on the side that I would have been on. They were very defensive, very knowledgeable. They were dropping, you know, resources and links to combat these people that were being very much fat phobic. And um, it boosted my work, not in a way I would have wanted it to, but it, it definitely was interesting to see how such a definitive statement that resonated so personally with me also resonated with people, not only in a positive way, but in a negative way. Um, and furthermore, saying yes to opportunities you might not feel ready for is truly the best thing you could do. There is no better opportunity to learn than to just saying yes and figuring it out as you go. The one thing I'm sure we've all heard is fake it till you make it. And there's nothing truer than that statement, genuinely. Like, um, it was my, uh, you know, my boss, Babs, that like had to push me to start my own convention table because she knew I was ready. She'd known me for so long. She'd known my work and how it had grown. So because of her, I started tabling. And, 
you know, I was very impressed and surprised by not only how many people recognized my work, but how many people would have never seen my work to begin with. So they came to my table, they very excitedly took business cards, they would stand there and follow me on the spot and like text me to their friends. It was very um, nerve wracking, but exciting. And it was definitely something where, you know, I did so many things different from that first time I did it to the next time. And even now I'm still advancing how I table. And I, I wish now I had put a picture of my first convention table compared to my convention table as of last year. It was a night and day difference. Um, and some other opportunities would be like, you know, if people want commissions of your work, definitely say yes, just deliver something you're proud of and do your best to, to just continue to make work that you're happy with when you're making your commissions. Um, being asked to work on a project where art is needed, you might not feel ready for, you know, not only the deadlines, but having to deliver so many deliverables on certain days and the order of operations, but it's something you figure out as you go and it's only going to make you stronger. And a lot of the things that you learn, you learn to apply to your own brand, which is really great. Um, man, word of mouth is probably one of the biggest, biggest ways to market yourself. And honestly, all that takes is putting yourself out there. So like I said, conventions exist, sure, but sometimes that's a big commitment for someone to make. You know, their conventions range anywhere from three to four days, and that doesn't include the day before where you set up and the day after where you're traveling back. So it's honestly a week-long endeavor. And on top of that, there's months of preparation that go into being ready for a convention. So if you can, do a small market instead to just get started get familiar with what it's like to have to be the customer service facing face for your own brand. And that's where working retail prepared me a lot for being able to not only talk to people very directly, but sell myself, like be passionate about what I'm talking about, tell them what my work is about and uh, where they can find me, what else I do. Uh, sometimes when I bring things to a table, like not all of it's there so I can kind of gauge what they're looking for and let them know I have it online. Or there's also one day events that happen in your community. Locally, there's a skate shop that will host like a one day event. And it's a very short term situation. It's like six hours. So you still have to go bring everything, set it up, break it down. But it's still putting yourself out there. It's still exposing yourself to your community and letting people know you exist. That also being said, you can do the same thing online. So you don't have to physically be there as beneficial as it can be. Just post everywhere online, no matter how dead the platform might look or it look, you know, how difficult it might seem to start out. Um, I regularly post on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, sometimes even Artful, which a lot of people got on initially, but is no longer very active. Um, TikTok is my newest endeavor, Twitter, Tumblr, I mean, literally everywhere. If you can include DeviantArt, Pinterest, um, Pinterest is a very big one for getting work spread around that no one really thinks about, which is very interesting. And that can be just as passively as starting a board on your own Pinterest, labeled your handle, and then uploading your work as you create it. You'd be impressed with how many people repin it and comment under it and are very excited to find you on Pinterest. Um, and uh, another one a lot of people don't think about is Reddit. Reddit has a lot of art communities, some niche, some more wide that are just dead, you know, general communities about digital art, traditional art, ink based art. You, you really just have to be willing to post and not expect a large reception. It's, it's about, showing up every day and being consistent and honestly about creating consistency. So if you start a handle on one platform, you should endeavor to make that handle the same handle across every platform so that you're very easy to find, you're very easy to recognize. If someone stumbles across your work on one platform that follows you on another, 
they're more likely to just automatically follow you on that new platform because they're excited that they can find you there too. And um, participating in hashtags obviously is part of that because those hashtags often spread across all those platforms. You will be able to find things like Getuary and you know, uh, whatever Inktober challenges are floating around and Mermaid all across these different platforms. So honestly, you're creating work that you can use and reuse, not only in the year you're making it, but in future years, those hashtags happen. And uh, the an important thing about making all that work is making sure you watermark it visibly. So putting your handle somewhere legibly is gonna help people get back to you, which is such a problem sometimes. Definitely trying to put your handle on somewhere that someone can't just crop the edge off. So avoid putting that handle like right on the corner or alongside the edge. Try to incorporate it into the art somewhere so that even if someone were to crop it in or zoom in on it, your handle is still very much visible. Um, I've had people like comment on my TikToks or like my Instagram posts like, oh my God, I saw a piece you made. Of course, it was a piece I made 10 years ago before I knew to watermark my own work. I've been trying to find you everywhere. I'm so glad I found you now. And it's, it's wild that the work that you make in the infancy of your career resonates with people so hard sometimes that they, they scour the ends of the internet for you. So as you start creating your work, no matter how, you know, if it's just a sketch or just a doodle, watermark it. Oftentimes it's the work you spend the less time on that goes more viral as backwards as that is. And one of the final tips that I can give is to collaborate with your community. So that could mean, you know, making an art print with a friend or doing a sticker sheet together where the stickers on the sheet are like both of your work and making sure that you guys are cross-pollinating your followings essentially because people that follow you may not necessarily follow your friend and people that follow your friends might not follow you. So it's a really great way to to create a boost for one another in terms of promoting one another. And that can all be summed up in one motto, be loud and be shameless. Be absolutely shameless with what you're doing. Reshare the same work over and over again and figure out new ways to reshare it, honestly. Um, it's, it's wild how many hours we spend on a piece only to post it once feel like it failed because it got maybe like 100 likes or like 30 likes, and then we never look at it again. When honestly, that one piece of work can be broken down into a week's worth of content, if not even more. So you can share the still image, share the time lapse of how you created it. Um, I've seen artists that will crop in closely on, on like their favorite parts of a piece and explain their process and then explaining how they started to how they finished the piece is a whole other post that can be a video or it can be a carousel slide where you know, the explanations happen every slide. And that's just weeks of content off of one piece of work you spent hours on. And it's content that you can reshare over and over and over again. Never feel like you're, you're being tied down into like creating new work. And that's the only time you can share. That's just, that's not true. And that's a lot of, um, it's a pitfall a lot of artists fall into. They'll post something new, they'll disappear off the internet, and then they'll come back like a month later with another new thing. And of course, the algorithm by then has started to decline on your platform. So that new thing that you're very excited about doesn't get the traction you were thinking it was going to get. And that's where resharing the same work you've created comes in handy. If you can post at least once a day and keep people engaged, remind people you exist. And even if it's old work, when you post new work, they get very excited about it because it's something they haven't seen before. So it stands out in, in your body of work, but it also fits in at the same time. Um, and part of that is uh, understanding social media, honestly, doesn't, doesn't flow the way we think it does not all of your following is on at the same time. So personally speaking, when I've looked at the stats on my platforms, I see that my following tends to be on around noon. I've talked to friends where their following's on at 10 in the morning 
and other friends where they're following is like two to 3 p.m. is about where they should be posting. So you should make it an intentional post if you're going to post while it's today, even if it's old work. Post around the time that your following is on and then make sure to reshare that work later on in the day or earlier in the evening, somehow the next day. And on Twitter, that's as easy as retweeting your old work or on Tumblr, reblogging it so it bumps up back to the top of people's dashboards. On Instagram, it's as easy as taking that post and making a story, letting people know that you've posted something new. Some people will very cleverly hide what they've posted in order to get people to click through rather than just swipe over it. And it's, it's just very easy to make sure you reshare your work constantly. And if you have nothing new to post that day, honestly, on a platform like Twitter or Tumblr, or even a Facebook, if you have a Facebook page, it's easy to scroll back to old work that you've posted and just give those a little retweet. And that's your engagement for the day. We're reminding people about the work you've made already. But one of the things that doesn't work, obviously, is silence. So disappearing for extended periods of time, um, failing to show up, showing up every day on social media and promoting yourself is the commitment to make a connection with your following. And honestly, it doesn't have to be toxic. You don't have to be on your social media 24 seven and making sure your fingers in every pie and that you're present. Um, it's really just making the effort and working smarter and not harder to make something sustainable. Um, and the fear of trying something new. I know I've seen that encountered by so many artists where so many of my friends and colleagues are missing out because they're scared of trying a new platform, of the learning curve that comes with learning that platform, or you know they've heard negative things about that platform. So they have immediately dismissed it already. For a lot of them, that's TikTok right now. They don't wanna learn TikTok. They don't understand the use of audio or trends. Um, they're artists, they're not videographers. So that's another like big thing. It's like, oh God, now it's another thing I have to learn. Um, but in, you know, I'm dating myself by saying this as angels in the outfield, you know, it's often misquoted. As they said, if you build it, they will come. So no matter what you have to offer on whatever platform, it's easy to just start posting what you know how to post and then learn as you go whether that's through mimicking a video that you've seen another artist make or just trying a new idea you have, there's no way to fail, honestly. And um, another thing I've personally seen that doesn't work is being a trend hopper. That, you know, it's easy to follow trends. It's great to follow trends, but again, it's not sustainable. Um, in an effort to chase these trends, you often will miss the trend by maybe a couple of weeks or if you're researching these trends, that takes up time that you could be using to create content rather than, you know, trying to find ways to use content or create content around specific ideas. Um, uh, it takes very little effort to just do a trend when it comes your way and when it fits naturally with your brand. Otherwise, you're just better off, you know, doing your own thing because in a giant giant blender that is social media where everyone's saying and doing the same things, following your own trend often stands out more because you're one person out of a sea of people that is doing something different. And I know we are running a little short on time, <laughs> but to quickly talk about growing your brand on multiple platforms in terms of self-promotion, um, it's a labor of love. It's not easy. And you will often find that your followings genuinely do not match up. Like my Facebook page outranks all of my social media. And then soon after that, Instagram is my next biggest and then Twitter and then TikTok. And then finally my Tumblr. And for a lot of people, it's backwards. Their Twitter is the biggest following they have, but they get more engagement on their Instagram, which has half the following, if not less. And it's not a game about how many followers you have. It's more a game of how much engagement do you get with those followers. You can have an account with a thousand followers, but if every follower is present 
and engaged with your content, you're already far more successful than a person who has a following of half a million and gets maybe 30 likes and two comments on every post. So definitely don't be discouraged by the gaps that you see or the discrepancies that you see across your social media. And be very aware that as long as you're building an engaged audience, you're already succeeding. The best advice I have for learn, like learning how to build your following across multiple platforms would be um, learning the language of that platform. So oftentimes what will be a success on Twitter will totally flop on Instagram, but Tumblr will also enjoy it because you know it's it's charming or it's funny or it's thoughtful promoting and Twitter and Tumblr care a little more about having a conversation, whereas Instagram cares more about aesthetics and um, just, you know, something that looks very lovely or something that is very dreamy and inspires nostalgia or something that makes you go, oh my gosh, I wish I had that or I wish I was there. And there's just different languages that happen across platforms for myself. So I often see that my videos will do very well, obviously, on Instagram and on Facebook and on TikTok but Twitter is not very interested in my videos, neither is Tumblr. And that's the opposite for some of my friends who post videos and they'll get, you know, very, a lot of engagement, a lot of traction and interaction, but um, there's still images don't do as well. So it's honestly finding about how the language of each platform correlates to your work personally, so that when you make all that content that you share across platforms, you can make it more intentionally, essentially. So you will know to share the still image of a work you did on Instagram, but if you have a time lapse ready to roll for Instagram, maybe you share that first on Twitter and like start to diversify what you're posting across platforms and not posting the same thing across all your platforms at the same time. Um, it's also very good in terms of learning where to invest your time and energy. And um, I've done that by, well, I have a Shopify and Shopify will let me know where my customers are coming from essentially. So I made it a point of making a discount code for each platform. And it was very simple. It just, it was like, hello from so-and-so or, you know, hi from TikTok. And when orders were coming in, I could start to tally where all these orders were coming from across what platform so that I knew at the end of the day, which platform was working best for me, where I was reaching more people and where I should definitely put my effort in terms of making content. And uh, that's definitely my newest endeavor for me right now. TikTok has been a very, very helpful tool to the point I like automated my other social media and scheduled out posts for Twitter and Instagram and now all of my effort is being expended into growing this new market on TikTok because I've already built my followings elsewhere. I can trust in them to stay. And now I can experiment on a new platform and start putting myself out there more wholly, essentially. Um, I hope that was all in all very helpful. <laughs> Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. I've never great. had to put into words what I do. So that was, that was a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Um, I guess I want to thank CrowdFunder for having me out. And uh, we can start taking questions in the time that we have left. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that was that was really awesome. Thank you for sharing that. We, we do have a few questions. I know we are... Uh, a little tight on time, but I do want to remind folks, feel free to type your questions in or raise the hand. There's a raise hand feature and I'll call on you if you'd rather vocally ask your question. Uh, I hope we can get through them all. But um, the first question we had was, uh, do you have a schedule for self promo or is it an organic act for whenever a new piece is completed? Um, I do have a schedule in terms of, uh, I block it out on my calendar when there's going to be a hashtag and I'll make it like an all day event on my iCal. So I know since I like participating in Mermaid, I lock off all of May as a potential Mermaid like participation 
and I'll set a reminder for a week ahead of time in case I want to start making some stuff early. Um, often I'll save my new mermaid pieces for Patreon and I'll reshare old mermaid work publicly from the past years. And then the next year I'll share whatever I had made for Patreon as a new thing and just keep doing that. Um, but it's a, it's a marriage of both. So while I do have some intentional stuff out on my calendar, honestly, trends happen so organically that you'll sometimes come across a trend that just fits with your work so well, you can't help but participate. And you'll know when that happens, you'll start reaching for your work already without even realizing it. Cool. I think that kind of is a good segue into the next question you're talking about trends. And the question was, uh, when you say don't chase trends, can you be a bit more specific as in, um, do you mean don't chase subject matter or in terms of style? Well, I can't say in subject matter or style because that's going to be a personal thing for you. If there's something trending in terms of subject matter or style that you're passionate about, go for it. What I mean is don't chase like hashtag trends. And often it applies for artists in that, you know, they'll, they'll share like um, a certain audio with a certain time lapse and that won't work for everybody universally. You might not have the work at the time that fits into that trend and you're gonna end up just exhausting yourself trying to make work to fit into that trend. So while it is relevant and while it is exciting, if you don't have something ready made for it, and you don't think you have the passion to make something for it, let it fall to the wayside. Other trends will come that fit you better and that will put you in front of the audience you wanna be in front of. Awesome, yeah, cool. Uh, one more question here from Michelle. It's, uh, hey Gigi, thanks for all these tips. Uh, one question, you mentioned your audience on Twitter was mostly engaged at certain type of day. Uh, a certain time of day, I assume you mean. Uh, how did you find what time that was? Is there a tool that you use for it? What's the secret uh, sauce there? <laughs> Twitter has uh, analytics tools that I don't think people know exist on the back end. It's like a completely different website, but um, you can Google on you know how to find the link to that. It's one of the like settings sub links off to the side of your dashboard. And when you click through, it will break down month by month, not only what your most popular post that month was, but the post that got the most engagement, how many followers you got that month. And it, it kind of helps you gauge not only what time of day that post happened where like you had gotten the most engagement, but what kind of content across the months really engaged your audience. Cool. Yeah. So Twitter is own analytics tool. It's a good tip to Google that. I'm sure I'll pop right up. Mm -hmm. um, all right. We've got one more that just came in. Uh, what do you say to artists who feel like they're annoying, quotation marks, on social media if they promote themselves too much? Um, I'm going to say there is no such thing as too much, honestly. Okay. Uh, even when people feel like they're promoting themselves too much, it's probably still too little. And that's because you're so conscientious already of the fact that you're promoting yourself so much. You can't help but naturally try to curb it. Uh, that's the only way to get seen. You have to be annoying. And that's part of being loud and being shameless. Don't be ashamed you're promoting yourself too much. Just lean into it. I see my friend um, on TikTok, she shares at least four or five time lapses a day. And they're time lapses she shared before but she gets the same engagement every time because it's work people love to see. So honestly, just be annoying. That's, that's what you should strive to be. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's your work. You know, you got to get it out there. Right. Um, hundred cool. percent. I, I do have a, a few questions here as well. Like I said, uh, I, I want to make sure we get the most out of the hour we have with you, Gigi. So if anybody yeah. has questions, keep putting them out there. I'll, I'll try to read them out. But, uh, you know, I think one thing that I kind of wondered, you mentioned at, uh, towards the beginning of the presentation that you're even continuously at the moment still um, evolving your style and really kind of nailing down what what your art is um yeah. did you did you or do you still currently find any challenges as your artwork evolves or do you feel like it's evolving in a way that the the followers that you have are also appreciating that evolution of your work do you find like 
Are you losing followers? Are you gaining new followers as a result of it? I mean, anything that, you know, because I imagine a lot of artists are also, you know, figuring out their style. Like that would right. be a concern of theirs. Like, oh, somebody like this style of work, but I'm into this a little more now. Am I going to lose right. my followers? Um, and honestly, that that is something that I talk with my art friends all the time, where, you know, you fall into this fear of losing the following you've built. And I've got to say that that fear is part of what holds so many artists back from growing in that because you're making work that your audience at the time likes, you're failing to serve yourself the fulfillment that you deserve. You're going to naturally call your following as you grow. So you're going to always have that genuine core following that will adore your work no matter where it goes, no matter what you do, no matter how you grow it or expand it. And then there's going to be followers that, you know, they like the old you and they're fully comfortable with walking away. But in making that new work, you're signaling to new people to come your way, honestly. And that's how you start to build a following that just genuinely cares not only about you and the connection you guys have, but your work as a whole rather than as what it is right now. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. Yeah. So I definitely don't let that affect me in terms of what I want to do if I have an idea and I want to do it I make it happen if I lose mm -hmm. 100 followers okay then they were 100 followers that were probably never really interested in my core values to begin with that's fine mm -hmm. yeah good points yeah uh two more questions that have come in um, so yeah. the first one is uh, do you have any advice uh, for encouraging your followers to click through your shop patreon or any other ways to support your work uh support your you directly I'm sorry uh, rather than just following your work oh okay I struggled with this one for a while and that was in part because I was camera shy mm. but um I found that putting myself physically in front of the camera and like showing people I have things that you can purchase to support me um encourages them a lot to click through to my shop it's it's um <laughs> it's rough, you know, creating content because it's the content that's always out in front and never you as the human. Mm -hmm. If, if you could like even do like a voiceover of stuff you're selling and like showing your hands, displaying things that you're selling, or, um, even like a, a video of your hands scrolling through your Patreon about, you know, some stuff that you have to offer behind the scenes, that connection is what's very valuable in terms of encouraging your following to click through or to come support you somewhere else. It's that reminder that you're a human making this work. And as a human, you need to pay bills and eat to continue to create the work that they love. And you're not just some sort of machine that's putting out this work that they get to enjoy for free every day, essentially. So my advice is create and cultivate a personal connection with your following. Remind them you're a person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, okay, cool. The next one is from Tuco. And first of all, it's hi and thank you. Uh, Tuco <laughs> says, you know, he, uh, Tuco is a NSFW comic artist and um, they found it really difficult to promote themselves or myself, I'm kind of third person in them. Uh, mm -hmm. It's quite disappointing because drawing is work too, right? They want to promote that. Um, do you, like, have you found similar difficulties or, or challenges and how did you kind of get past them? Strangely enough, I have. While I do create, you know, work that's consumed by everybody, I do have softer pieces that I share behind the scenes on my Patreon. But um, the way I get past it is by finding platforms that are willing to cater to me. So Twitter doesn't care so much about the not safe for work content in terms of being allowed to share it. And that's at the time, right? Sometimes Twitter is a little more aggressive. Sometimes Twitter is a little more lenient. Um, and then understanding that on places like TikTok and you know Instagram sometimes, uh, even Facebook, they're more aggressive with not safe for work art. So you have to find ways to cheekily censor it, to like remind people that you make beautiful work. It's just not consumable if you're under 18. <laughs> and I've had friends that do really funny ways of censoring their not safe for work work where they use a bunch of silly emoticons to like cover up the important bits or they'll put up like caution tape over the important bits and say in the caption and on the image that you can, you know, go find the rest of it either on your personal website or if you have a subscription club where like there's a password to see your work or your Patreon once again. Um, 
So the way to get around it is honestly working with the platform instead of against it. Don't to just, you know, don't just put it up and hope for the best, hope they won't take it down because nine times out of 10, they'll find it, they will. And then your account gets kind of shadow banned for having broken the TOS essentially. So I got to say, just continue to put it out there. Just be clever about how you're hiding the mature parts about it. Um, otherwise, there's Discord you can join where there's other not safe for work artists also doing the same thing. And they probably might have way more relevant not safe for work advice. Like I know some of my not safe for work friends use itch.io to share spicy comics, spicy pinups. And it's like a per pay as you buy basis. So people can just buy the comics they want or buy the pinup they want to see it. And not only are you being supported, but you're being hosted on a not safe for work friendly platform. Yeah, so awesome, good advice. Um, I think that's it for questions. Thank you so, so much, <laughs> Gigi. We really appreciate all of your, your knowledge you've shared with us and the time you've taken to um, kind of walk us through your journey and hopefully help some of the folks on this uh, webinar and future people that watch the recordings uh, kind of <laughs> feel a little more, uh, uh, confident in growing their own follower base and on social media. So thank you so much again. Yeah, hopefully they, you know, hopefully this information is still relevant in decades to come because social media is its own beast for sure. And it's constantly mm -hmm. changing, but um, I, mm -hmm. thanks y'all yeah, for I, having me. <laughs> absolutely. And I think it will be relevant. I think everything you've shared with us has really kind of hit the nail on the head about being authentic and your true self and an artist. And I think that that's a piece that doesn't change is the algorithms too. So uh, that's you know, true. I think, that's true. <laughs> I think at the end of the day, everything you shared with us is going to go a long way for everybody. Yay. Well, hi, future people, if you're watching this. <laughs> and um, goodbye to everybody who came. Thank you for coming. And thank you again, Crowdfunder, for having me. Yes. Thank you. And thank you all the folks for joining in as well.